اعوذ باللہ السمیع العلیم من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ولا حول ولا قوة الا باللہ العلی العظیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین الحمد للہ والحمد حقه کما يستحقه حمدا کثیرا وأعوذ به من شر نفسي إن النفس لأمارة بالسوء إلا ما رحم ربي والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من أول يوم ظلمهم إلى قيام يوم الدين صلى الله عليك سيدي ومولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا نبي الله صلى الله عليك وعلى ابن عمك أمير المؤمنين صلى الله عليك سيدي ومولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسع ويا باب نجاة الأمة غريب يا شهيد كربلاء يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا من يرتد منكم عن دينه فسوف يأتي الله بقوم يحبونه يحبهم ويحبونه أعزة على المؤمنين أذلة على الكافرين يجاهدون في سبيل الله ولا يخافون لوم تلائم آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم For the purification of the souls, the enlightenment of the hearts For the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف Enlighten your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad His name brings about a sense of strength in the heart. His remembrance is a source of inspiration for the souls. His legacy is widespread throughout the centuries and around the world. It is difficult not to stand in admiration and not to be proud to be of the followers of the brother of the Holy Prophet and the greatest human being after the Prophet, Amir al-Mu'mineen wa Imam al-Muttaqeen Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. This magnificent human being epitomized the very qualities of a perfect individual sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the guidance and for the well-being of all mankind. The love of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam is one that exists deeply and is found within our hearts and within our setup. It is not possible to find amongst the different communities around the world a group of people who will not love this individual, who have not learned to understand his excellence and his brilliance. 
In fact, from a young childhood, you and I have been raised with the love of this honorable individual. And we have become more and more attached to his personality. The more we understand about his life, the more we appreciate his teachings, the more we recognize the importance of what he set out to achieve. That's why the famous Arab poet says, as far as our children, as far as our upbringing, as far as how we were inculcated with the love of Amir al-Mu'mineen, he famously says, لا عذب الله أمي إنها شربت حب الوصي وغذتنيه في اللبن He says, may Allah never punish my mother because she drank the love of Ali and she fed it to me through the milk. وكان لي والد يهوى أبا حسن فصرت من ذي وذا أهوى أبا حسن I have a father who loves Abu al-Hasan Ali. And that's why as a result of my father and my mother, I was brought up in the love and the admiration of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And this recognition is a recognition that continues and we see it indeed all around in different places all around the world, strengthening as time progresses. And it is not only Muslims who have indeed discovered the beauty of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Even non-Muslims now have begun to explain their admiration of how this individual has left this impression upon themselves. There is a Christian by the name of Paul Salama. He is a Christian Lebanese historian and poet. He comes and he has a long poem in praise of Amir al-Mu'mineen. He says amongst his poem in honor of Ali, he says, لا تقل شيعة هواة علي إن في كل منصف شيعية. He says, don't say it is only the Shia who love Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because there are people who have intellect and have understood who this man is. جلجل الحق في المسيحي حتى عد من فرط حبه علوية. He says the love of Ali has become so strong in the heart of the Christian to the extent that now he is referred to as a man who is the lover of Ali. إن لم يكن علي نبيا فلقد كان خلقه نبويا. If Ali was not a prophet. I stand to say that his ethics and his morals was that of prophets. Then he concludes and he says, فَيَا سَمَاءُ شَهَدِي وَيَا أَرْضُ قَرِّي وَخْشَعِي إِنَّنِي ذَكَرْتُ عَلِيَّا He says, O oh heavens bear witness, O oh earth tremble. I have mentioned the name of Ali ibn Abi that is a recognition from individuals who have discovered the beauty of the commander of the faithful. No doubt he has a special place in our hearts. And every time we speak about him, there is that attachment to his legacy and his life. No doubt that comes from his association with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah has placed his love in the hearts of mankind. When you and I examine the world today, and when we come to the conclusion that one of the key facets of how human beings live today is to exceed and to be given the title of people who have achieved more than others. Meaning, people want to be the first in competitions. They want to attain first position in tournaments. They want to gain the most likes on a social media site. They want to be praised the most. It is all about the human being's intrinsic nature to be the best. Who was the best after the Prophet of Islam? Who was the best individual after Rasulullah? I tell you, tell me of a man who was other than Ali, who was born inside the house of Allah. Other than the commander of the faithful who was raised so closely by the messenger of Allah. Other than Ali ibn Abi Talib who slept in the bed of the Prophet sacrificing his life. Other than the first Imam as the man 
who married his beloved daughter, Sayyidatun Nisa, and no other would be a match for her. Tell me any other than the commander of the faithful to be an individual who was so courageous in the battlefield after the Holy Prophet. Tell me of another human being who stood on the shoulders of the Prophet with him to destroy the idols inside the Kaaba. Who else other than Ali was given the title of being the brother of Rasulullah both in Mecca and in Medina? Who else other than the Amir al-Mu'mineen was told the truth is with him and he is with the truth. Who is other than Ali who was told by the Prophet, I fought for the revelation of the Quran. You will fight, you will protect the interpretation, the ta'wil of the Holy Quran. I tell you when it comes to merits and being the first after the Prophet of Islam, this holy individual stands unchallenged and indeed undefeated in these qualities and much more. And that is why when we come to analyze and examine how people have witnessed this association, we see that that bond with Amir al-Mu'mineen is a bond that people refuse to dissociate. In throughout the times, how many have laid their lives because they're lovers of Ali? How many people have sacrificed because they were being told either you choose Ali or you choose the path of death? And indeed, they chose the path of Ali at the same time seeking death. Because today you find, even not more than a few years ago, in places like Iraq, where people were being picked and were told to what? To dissociate themselves from the commander of the faithful. Yet they refused to do so when they were identified from their badges and from their ID tags of whether they were Shia or not they would refuse to do so. And when they would not dissociate from Amir al muminin there would only be one path for them. That path would be martyrdom, but it's a path that is sweet in the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Peace and blessings be upon him. When we examine this phenomenal character, this individual that today we are not able to appreciate all of his qualities, and you know, they call us people who exaggerate who Ali ibn Abi Talib was. One of the scholars says, I was told, you exaggerate, you speak too much fadail of Ali. You are someone who is excessively in love with this man. I said to him, don't worry, I am still at the A and I haven't yet gone further. He said, what do you mean? He said, don't think I'm still at the A of Ali. I am at the A of the alphabets of Fadail of Ali. No doubt you and I are not worried when people come and tell us, what is this association with Ali ibn Abi Talib that you have? Because we have understood his excellence. We have understood that through him is salvation. A man who was born in the best of places and martyred in the best of places and was martyred on the best of nights. A man who lived his life for the association of Allah and Tawheed. A man who gave everything for the religion of Allah. A man whose eloquence and, and bravery and wisdom and dedication is unmatched after the Holy Prophet. Why would we reduce as our association and our remembrance of this honorable individual? This association must continue and it must live on. Yet for us to strengthen that bond with Ali the Magnificent, Ali, the man whose heart was full of love towards others. Ali, who wanted his followers to follow in his footsteps in the best way. Those around Amir al-Mu'mineen recognized this. Salman al-Muhammadi al-Farisi, radhwanullahi ta'ala alayhi, one day was walking behind Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen looks behind and he sees that Salman takes every step that Ali takes, exactly placing his feet where Amir al-Mu'mineen had placed his feet. So he is asked, O oh Salman, why are you doing this? He said, I am to follow this man in every feature in his life, even how he walks and even where he places his feet. Look at that 
and the way that those around Amir al-Mu'mineen recognized that this association is blessed, this association is the association of salvation. When the Quran comes forward and says to you and I, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثِ Speak to people about the blessings of Allah. Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Ask someone, what is this ni'mah that I should speak to people about? People say to him, it is the blessing of life. It is the blessing of health. It is security. All these are wonderful blessings. But the Imam says there is one blessing that supersedes and comes above all. The Quran tells us about this favor. The Quran informs us, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا Today I have perfected the religion and I have completed my favors upon you. He says, Imam alayhi salam says, that favor, that blessing that Allah has given us that we should be proud of and speak to people about is the honor of being the followers of Amir al-Mu'mineen and the wilaya of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And that is something that we should be indeed proud of to say to ourselves, Alhamdulillah alladhi ja'alana min al-mutamassikeen bi walayati sayyidi wa mawlai amir al-mu'mineen. How much of an honor to be in this position. How much of a special grace that Allah wa ta'ala has given us that we wake up in the morning knowing that we're in this path of Siratul Mustaqeen. When the Prophet of Islam says to Ali, Ya Ali, Anta Siratul Mustaqeen. But for me to appreciate Amir al muminin I ask this question. How did it all begin? How do I follow in the footsteps of this great individual? His story what was the foundation of it? What was the pinnacle of it? How did it all strengthen? In order to understand the excellence of this man, we have to appreciate his childhood and his youthful age. Youthful age today is considered to be the age of energy, the age where the individual is able and wanting to uh, transform and to change things and has the willingness and the desire and the hunger to be able to put the effort in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to this youthful age, it is considered in Islamic studies and teachings to be an age of immense importance. And when you look at the life of Amir al muminin there is so much to be gained for our youngsters and for our elders in raising their kids in the path of the religion of Islam under the umbrella of the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mini. When we examine how he lived his youthful age, let's look at two situations and seek to derive lessons from that particular element, which then formed and shaped the character of Amir al-Mu'mini. The first is when he was 10 years of age. What happened? the Prophet of Islam receives the revelation for the first time. Jibra'il descends on Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord. We believe the Prophet was absolutely aware. He was not hesitant. He was not shaky. He was not... Unsure, he was firm in his knowledge that he is a prophet from God. This is the first revelation. Who is the first to receive him and to support him? A 10-year-old boy who never bowed down to any idols. And that's why out of all the Sahaba today, he is referred to by our brothers as Karram Allah Wajha. May Allah illuminate his face because his face never bowed down to an idol. He never prostrated other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this 10 year old comes, wants to support the Prophet. The Prophet says to him, what? Yes, come with me. He doesn't say you're very young. The Prophet of Islam doesn't dismiss him. Doesn't say, I need someone who's a bit older than you. I need from amongst the elders of the community. I appreciate your help, but when you become a bit, little bit older, 
I will come back to you in help. No, the Prophet displayed immense reliance and support of Amir al muminin was sufficient in that they were a unit. They came together with Khadija al-Kubra sallallahu alayha to form this first household from the religion of Islam that bowed down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the Kaaba in order to demonstrate the principles of the religion. Yet importantly, when Imam Amir al muminin was 12 or 13 years of age, the Quran reveals what says, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ Go and announce Islam now after two years or three years of relative concealment. Now it's time to announce. Amir al muminin comes. The Prophet of Islam says to him, I'm going to invite Quraysh, the heads of Quraysh. I'm going to invite them in the house of your father Abu Talib. I'm going to ask you to cook for them. 40 people. 12, 13 years of age. Ya Ali, you go and prepare the food. This is found in Sunni and Shia narrations. Amir al muminin at this tender age takes and seizes this opportunity. This responsibility given to him with honor. Bala, Ya Rasulullah, I will do it. He goes. The narration says Amir al muminin is trying to prepare the food. And the Prophet of Islam comes, yes? He places some of his sacred saliva within the food and places his hands and stares it. When the people came, the heads of Quraysh came, Ali ibn Abi Talib would serve them the food. At this young age, the food was not enough for 40 by looking at it, but they all ate and ate and the food would look as though it was untouched. And people, gathered. Question, the Prophet of Islam giving this responsibility to a 12, 13 year old, what does this mean to you and I? Ali ibn Abi Talib seizing this opportunity, what does it mean to you and I? It refers to the beautiful concept of initiative and giving responsibility, meaning that the Prophet of Islam recognized that as far as youngsters and our youth is concerned, we need to empower them. We need to give them encouragement. We need to facilitate for them and tell them, go, come on, you can achieve, you can become successful, you can serve, you can achieve greatness. When they feel this sense of belonging, when they feel a sense of dignity, Amir al muminin felt the sense of honor that he was serving Rasulullah. When someone would come and praise him, he would say, Ana abdun min abidi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I am a servant from the servants of Rasulullah. This was the honor for Ali ibn Abi Talib. Today when we face these challenges that for example our youth face, in many different places around the world, when they feel or many of the communities feel that they're not necessarily taking part, or they're not engaging, or they're not necessarily attending, or they're not interested in faith or taking part in the religion or activities associated with the religion, I guess one lesson we can take from this is that we have to facilitate and somehow encourage groups of our youth and individuals with potential to seize the opportunity and to build by providing them what is necessary in order to enhance themselves as well as activities within the community. I tell you, the Prophet of Islam utilized this throughout his holy life. You know, when it came to sending an individual towards Medina, who did he send? Mus'ab ibn Umair. Mus'ab was young. Mus'ab would belong to an aristocratic family, family which was very wealthy, selling perfume. Rasulullah says, you go to Medina, Yathrib, and invite people towards the religion. He was very young. He came into Medina. He started to read the Quran. Some say he was 20, 21 years of age. When he began to read the Quran, people walked past. They were mesmerized by the words of Allah. They became Muslim. Some of them threw themselves in the well so that they purify themselves before going home because they said, we want to become Muslim right now. They were inspired by a young man. That's why the Prophet of Islam came to Medina and it was prepared for him. The groundwork was started by a youth, by a young man. And you see that even towards the end of the life of the Prophet of Islam, when he is about to leave this world, he has a huge army to go and fight the Roman Byzantines, to seek revenge over the death 
and, uh, and the, of many Sahaba and the, the battle of Mu'tah. So what does he do? He appoints a man by the name of Usama, Ibn Zayd, Ibn Haritha, the son of his adopted son. Yes, Usama Ibn Zayd. He was 19 or 20 years of age. He says to him, you become the leader to the extent that some of the companions were in their 50s and 60s came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, you're making a 20 year old command over us. I should be in charge. I am the one who's older. I am the one who's wiser. Prophet of Islam, according to Shahristani in Al-Milal wa Nihal, the famous book. Yes, he comes and says what? He says, Allah man an jayshi Usama. Whomsoever does not go on the army of Usama, Allah's mercy is withdrawn from them. The Prophet of Islam is saying, these youth have phenomenal energy and ability. All they need is that spark. All they need is that charge. I remember one of the communities in America, what did they decide? They said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to place the ball in the court of the youth. They said, what do you mean? When I went to visit them, they said, we gave them Thursday night program. They, we said, you organize it yourself. We give you money. We support you financially to start off with. You run the program. You get the speakers. You recite the dua or you do a debate. You do an activity. The entire program is yours and we will not interfere. And they saw after a few months that more and more youth came because they realized it's their own program. It's people like them who are organizing it. They realize there is relative freedom. They realize there is initiative. There is encouragement to take part in this. That's why that's the first important area in the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen that built his character, his initiative, his drive, and the Prophet's support from a young age that built the personality of the commander of the faithful. Similarly, what do you find? You find the Prophet of Islam when he's about to leave towards Medina. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him that there are people who are going to kill you. So leave. He informs Ali. The Prophet says to Ali, would you sleep on my bed? The Prophet is then said and told by Ali one thing, which is what? He says to him, Ya Rasulullah, our Taslam, are you going to be saved? Are you going, is your life going to be protected? The Prophet said, yes. He said, then very well, I will do so. So he sleeps on the bed of the Prophet. And when the non-believers, they come to strike, they remove the cloth and they see Ali ibn Abi Talib at that moment. Question, did Ali know his life will be saved? Most likely no. Most definitely no, the ulama say. Because that would take away the merit. That would mean nothing. If the Prophet would say to him, by the way, and we don't have any evidence, by the way, that Rasulullah would say to Ali ibn Abi Talib, sleep on my bed and I guarantee you that your life will be saved. No. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, I will give my life for your life, Ya Rasulullah. Because my concern is my faith. My concern is Islam. Above all, my concern is Allah. So I will give my life. And that's why Allah showed him off to the angels. The narration says, after he slept in the bed of the Prophet, Allah summoned Jibra'il and Mika'il, two angels, and says to them, who will sacrifice the life for the other amongst you? Both Jibra'il and Mikael didn't want to. And Allah says, go down to the earth and protect my servant Ali. And say to him what? You have tried to sacrifice your life for my servant Muhammad. They came, they descended. Amir al-Mu'mineen was on the bed, sleeping. They came next to him and said to him, Bakhin, Bakhin, laka ya Ali. Congratulations, O Ali. Who are saying? Jibra'il and Mikael. وَقَدْ يُبَاهِي بِكَ اللَّهُ مَلَائِكَةَ السَّمَاءِ Allah is showing you off to the angels of the heavens. That is a realization to start off with about the sacrificial nature of Amir al-Mu'mineen. What does that mean? That sacrifice from a young age, a youthful age, he still has all his life. He's not married. Yes. He still hasn't seen. He was perhaps, if we talk about that he was 10, when he, he was 23 years of age. 22 years of age, he's still in the fruits of his youthfulness. Yes? And yet he would do this. Today I ask you, when we look at around in our communities and our setups and the way that our youth are examining and looking at the religion, how are they looking at it? 
they're looking at it with the mindset that I refer to as microwave religion. What does that mean, microwave religion? Our sisters will know, and some of the brothers who are good cooks will know, that when it comes to good, proper food, you cook it. You don't buy it from the supermarket or grocery store and you heat it up. That is when you don't have time. That is often when you're trying to finish something quickly, yes? That is when you don't want to put the effort. You're not really bothered. I'm not keen to cook. I'm not interested to prepare and get the ingredients and look at the recipe and meticulously prepare this food. No, I just put it in the microwave. Two minutes, alhamdulillah, I'm satisfied. What does microwave religion mean? Today, some of our youth are looking at Islam and saying, you know what? I love the Prophet. I love Ali. I know the Quran is good. I know Salah is good. I know about Abdullah and Hussein is good. I come to Muharram, no problem. I'll come a few nights in Muharram. Ramadan, maybe on one or two nights I'll come. Yes. And I'll practice my faith whenever possible. But, please, why can't I have a girlfriend if the boy? Why I can't, for example, go to pubs and clubs and discos and bars? Or why can't I gamble? Why I can't shake the hands of the opposite gender? Why I can't watch this? Why I can't take part in interest? Why I can't go swimming in a mixed swimming pool? But my friends do it. I want to be like them. It's not fair. Islam is not good, but Islam is not treating me well. I want to put religion in the microwave because I don't want to put the struggle. I don't want to go through hardship. I don't want to put the effort. There is no emphasis upon working hard and attaining reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This working hard is subjective, by the way, in the idea that it's not excessively complicated. It is not extremely difficult. Allah has not told us live in the cave. He hasn't said, you know, isolate yourself from the community. No, live a dignified, honorable life. But there is a code. This code of practice, Allah says, is for you, not for me. I know what is best for you. You adhere to it, you attain paradise. Subhanallah, some of our youth, yes, I want Jannah. But can I please have some alcohol? They want them, you know, to have everything and still be able to attain whatever Allah wa ta'ala has given to those who struggle and put the hardship in. Yes, Amir al-Mu'mineen himself would say, Ala wa anna thamana anfusakum al-jannah. The soul of your, the price of your soul is paradise. Allah has put a price tag, you know, on it. It's Jannah. Don't sell it for anything else. Today we're selling it for cheap. We're selling it because of our desires, because of our materialism, because of false or wrong people who are we surrounded with. Friends who are friends of vice. Yes. That is a recognition we have to realize that I need to put in the effort. I need to wake up in the morning for Fajr. Oh, but brother is really hard. It's so tough to wake up in the morning during the summer. Yes. For example, when the Fajr is five or six o'clock, for instance, it's very difficult for me to wake up. I can't go back to sleep afterwards. Right. Oh, but brother, for a nine-year-old, it's so hard for her to wear the hijab. It's so difficult to wear, to perform the salah. Oh, but brother, you know, I've earned my money so much to give khums 20%. It's painful. It's hard. I don't want to give it up. But this pain is good. This pain is the remedy and it's the healing for success. This pain will make you a better human being. Quran says, You will never attain righteousness and be a good individual in the eyes of God until you give, give from that which you have. You see, Ismail, Hajar, and Ibrahim. Allah says to Ibrahim, take your wife, Hajar, and Ismail, and put them in the desert and leave them. Ya Allah, there's nothing there. No, just leave them. Why? Oh, Ibrahim, give up what you love. I want to see you give it up for my sake. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors Ibrahim and Ismail and Hajar. Gives them water, zamzam. The house of Allah, the Kaaba is built. 
But then Allah says, hold on, I want you, that son that you raised, Ismail, I want you to kill him, sacrifice him for me. Are you willing to give it up? Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to dedicate for the sake of Allah? He says, yes, I am. On three occasions, he goes to sacrifice, goes and to kill his own son, Ismail, and to slaughter him for the sake of Allah. Shaitan comes and says, don't do it, don't do it. Push Shaitan away, yes? Until Allah says, that was the greatest test and hardship for you. Examination, O Ibrahim, but you were successful. You attained what I want you to do. Allah says, all these challenges that you face are just obstacles I want you to overcome so that I reward you. Otherwise, Jannah becomes very worthless and easy without any hardship. Yes, if I can do whatever non-believers do and I'm given Jannah, what is the price of Jannah? What is the worth of this paradise? I have to earn it. It is a matter for me to seek it. Yes. Hence, we come to the idea that Musa, his mother also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to his mother, give up Musa. You love him so much, give him up for my sake. Allah says in Ramadan, give up food and water and your other enjoyments for my sake. I want to develop and inculcate within you the sense of giving and releasing yourself from that which distracts you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That which makes you honored. And that's why Amir al-Mu'mineen as well as the Ahl al-Bayt, were the masters in giving for the sake of Allah. And nothing would distract them from this. You know, when you look at his honorable lady, Sayyidatun Nisa Fatima, when people talk about Fadak, when individuals speak about, for example, the idea that her rights were taken away from her, and that she demanded Fadak, and that she said, I want Fadak back, no doubt. Her desire to gain Fadak was not because of the land and the materialistic nature of it. It was more political in the sense that it was her right and the right of her husband because the haqq had been removed and taken from her and her husband as far as the leadership of the Muslims is concerned. But I am confident that if someone had knocked on the door of the house of generosity and kindness, the house of Ali and Fatima, and had said, I want Fadak, please, Fatima would have said, take it. There is no doubt. You say to me, how didn't she give up her necklace in the famous story when there was the poor individual who came and had nothing and the prof and, and she gave the necklace and this man went, sold it in the mosque to Ammar. Ammar then returned it back to the Prophet and the Prophet returned it back to Fatima. Didn't she give up her wedding dress on the night, on the eve of her wedding? Didn't they sacrifice for three consecutive days? And so on and so forth. Amir al muminin and his household was a household of generosity and giving. From a young age, we are told that when he was in Medina one day, he saw Al-Maqdad ibn Al-Aswad. Al-Maqdad is amongst the famous companions of the Prophet and Amir al muminin Yes, he's considered an honorable individual. Ali ibn Abi Talib looks at him. Assalamu alaikum. Maqdad says, wa alaikum salam and just walks. So Amir al muminin realizes that there's something wrong. He's not himself today. He says to him, Maqdad, is everything okay? He says to him, Ya Ali, no, my family haven't eaten and they're hungry and I don't know where to get them money from or where to buy them food from. I'm desperate. I don't know what to do. So it's affecting my mood. Don't baby. Amir al muminin that day had gone and borrowed some money because his family have no food. He has nothing to give to his family. Yet, when you have spirit to give for the sake of Allah, everyone becomes more important than you. And so he gave what he borrowed to Maqdad. And he said to him, here, take it. Maqdad says, thank you very much. Now Amir al muminin goes to the mosque to pray salah. When the salah finishes, the Prophet looks around and says, Oh Ali, I'm coming with you today to your house so that we eat together. Amir al knows there's no food, yes? What does he say to the Prophet? Does he say, sorry, Ya Rasulullah. Wallah, we don't have anything. Come and see our kitchen. There's nothing there. Neither does he pick up the phone to his wife. Panic mode. Someone's, my father, my father-in-law, my father-in-law is coming. Come quickly, you know. Let's, no. He says, Ahlan wa sahlan. You're very welcome. Come to the house. Now they come to the house. 
The prophet says to Fatima, prepare some food for us. Lady of light goes to the area where she prepares the food. She looks up to the heavens and prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And says, you know that I don't have anything. And I would like to serve something to your messenger. The narrations tell us that Jibra'il descended with a plate of food from Jannah. And presented it to Fatima. Fatima picked it up, brought it up and presented it to Rasulullah. Rasulullah was smiling, didn't say anything. He wanted to eat. Amir al-Mu'mineen is looking at the Prophet. Where did this come from? The Prophet of Islam says to him, Ya Ali, this was one thanks that Allah wishes to give you for that donation you gave to Maqdad. For that sacrifice you did. That is why if I am a follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib, I take responsibility to ensure that I also give for the sake of God. Meaning what? Meaning that, for example, there are needy, there are orphans, there are destitute around the world. There are people who need our help and support, especially in the month of Ramadan. So I don't overlook their needs and I make sure that my deeds are perfumed and purified through sadaqa. Because sadaqa is zakatul a'mal. It's the purification of the deeds. That's number one. Number two, I think long term and I ensure that my community is strengthened by ensuring that I contribute and take part in the strengthening of my own mosque or Husayniya so that the activities continue. So that I attain thawab, which is known as sadaqa jariya. So that every time someone is guided, someone is inspired, someone is motivated, someone begins to pray in the mosque or hear something that changes their life positively, I will get the thawab until the day of judgment. For every dollar that I give, for every contribution that I make, especially in the month of Ramadan and especially on the nights of Qadr. That is a clear indication of the youthfulness and the youthful age of Amir al-Mu'mi. That's why in the age of 26, he stood in the battle of Uhud. And he demonstrated his courage that sometimes we need in our lives to excel. What do you mean? When he stood there, there was a jewel to be taken part. This jewel was a man by the name of Talha ibn Abi Talha. According to Tabari's tarikh, this man emerged and said, who will come and to fight with me? Amir al-Mu'mineen came forward, 26 years of age. And within a few, one strike, that man was finished. His brothers were enraged. They said, how dare you kill our brother? One after the other, they came. One after the other, they wanted to fight Ali ibn Abi Talib. They all came. History says there were three, four, or even more of them. They came. None of them came back. They were all finished. The father, Abu Talha, said, how dare you kill all my sons? I'm going to finish you off. He came to perform the duel against Amir al-Mu'mini before the battle of Uhud had started. Everyone was watching. There was a duel taking place. Ali ibn Abi Talib finished the life of the father as well as the sons. The Muslims said, Allahu Akbar. He never abandoned the Prophet of Islam like some Sahaba did. He fought and fought. One narration says his sword broke. He had 90 stab wounds in his body. Rasulullah came and gave him a sword. And he said, Ya Ali, ala tasma'u nida as Don't you hear what the heavens are saying? What is it? La fata illa Ali, wa la sayfa illa dhul fiqar. There is no sword like Dhul Fiqar. There is no youth like Ali. The Prophet is saying, you want to base your youthfulness, base it around Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because there is no youth like him. That is the recognition that is given by the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad al-Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. As a result, my dear brothers and sisters, of this solid upbringing, and a powerful de dedication and devotion of the youthfulness of Amir al-Mu'mineen. He became a man of God. Meaning what? He became an individual whose heart was pumping with the love of Allah. He became a man whose every deed and every word was for the sake of Allah. And this was not at a particular stage in his life, but it became more manifested and seen the more he lived on this earth. Meaning what? He became a manifestation of the love of Allah 
through the mercy that he had upon others. Please understand this very delicate point. When it comes to the Holy Prophet of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you except, in Arabic, illa means a tool of exclusivity. We have not sent you except as a mercy for mankind. Yes? Now, the Quran also says, وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ That I am going to come with my soul in terms of the mubahala against the Christians of Najran. Who is my soul? Ali ibn Abi Talib. The Amir is known as the soul of the Prophet, Nafsu Rasulillah, and Rasulullah who sent as a mercy to mankind. Therefore, after the Prophet, he continued to be the mercy to mankind. He continued to be the source by which people recognized how to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at his attention towards the orphans. Narrations tell us one day, he passed by an Eid and saw children playing, and he saw one child upset. He said to him, why are you upset? Why are you not playing with the children? He said to him, because it's the day of Eid. They all have new clothes and they're laughing at me. I'm an orphan. My father is gone. I don't have new clothes. Amir Mu'min says, come with me. He feeds him. He gives him new clothes and says, go. When he comes to play with the children, they stop. They said, I thought, we thought you were an orphan. He says, not after today. My father is Ali ibn Abi Talib. The father of the orphans. That his heart and his compassion and his love and his mercy and his generosity was something that people missed after the 21st of Ramadan, 40 years after Hijrah. People would not see that man who would come and help them in this way. That's why after the burial of the Imam, Imam al Hassan al Hussein alayhi salam saw a man who was crying. They said to him, What is wrong? He said that there was a man who would come and feed me every night. Not only feed me, but speak to me. He's blind. And, you know, give me company for the last three nights. You know, they, I miss him so much. They said, Hada Abuna Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is our father, Ali. He never identified himself. He never said to this man, by the way, I am Ali. By the way, I am so and so. No, he was Khalifa. Yet all he wanted was to serve Allah in this way. His heart was pumping with love and compassion. Look at what happened as far as Safin is concerned. When the water was prevented and prohibited from his army by Muawiyah, what did he do? He asked for water. They said no. He said, very well, we'll go and take it. They launched an attack and they managed to capture the water. Now his companions, some of them said, Ya Ali, we'll do the same to them. He says, no, we will not stoop to their level. Give them water and feed their animals too. They said, but that will strengthen them. That will give them energy. He says, no. A man who has a love of God has a love for the creation of God. And that was Ali ibn Abi Talib. When he was struck, he said, this man who struck me, whatever you give me, the milk, feed him too. Ya Ali, but he's a wretched kharijah, Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim. How are you treating him? Don't worry. Whatever you give me, and I am injured, and I am bleeding, treat him the same. Don't hurt him. He says, if I live, I will know how to deal with him. If I continue to live, leave him to me. Such is the heart of a man who absolved himself in the ocean and the elixir of the love of Allah. And you can discover that when you read his munajat. You can discover that when you read Dua Ikumayl. You know, Dua Ikumayl epitomizes, if you want to understand, similarly, Munajat al Sha'baniyah. And these wonderful words of the Imam alayhi salam that manifested through his actions but demonstrated his deep bond with his creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you know in Dua i Kumail, he redefines what love of Allah means. You know what he says? Ilahi wa sayyidi wa mawlai sabartu ala adabik fa kayfa asbiru ala firaqik wa habni صَبَرْتُ عَلَىٰ حَرِّ نَارِكْ فَكَيْفَ أَصْبِرُ عَنِ النَّظَرِ إِلَىٰ كَرَامَتِكْ أَمْ كَيْفَ أَسْكُنُ فِي النَّارِ وَرَجَائِي عَفُّكْ These are not the words of a man who claims to love Allah. These are the words of the man who is deeply in love with his Creator. He says to him, Ya Allah, if I am patient over your punishment in hell, I can never withstand one minute being away from you. 
one second being separated from me. How can I be placed in Jahannam and my hope in its entirety is your kindness, is your generosity. That is why we find today, as followers of Amir al-Mu'mineen, there is a responsibility on our shoulders to carry on this love, this mercy, this kindness. One of the Mu'mineen informed me, and I haven't seen this study, but he says there was a study late 2008 to 2009. There was a study that was made to see which countries are closer to Islam in terms of its regulations, its laws, and its practices. So there, some people studied Islamic law and, for example, some of the applications of Islam and the teachings of the Quran, and they said, today in the world, which country resembles it or is the closest to it? Not exactly resembles it. In other words, you know, does it apply it 100%, but out of all the countries, applies it the best. Do you know which country came out? New Zealand. I was very surprised when I heard this. You are living in a place, yes, that people's akhlaq might be better and people's moral conduct will be better in many places around the world. And therefore, the responsibility is even more. Do you know why? Because if, God forbid, your conduct with those individuals who are showing you kindness, who, for example, are trustworthy with you, if you're not at least the same back to them, what are we saying about our Imam and our Ahl al-Bayt? How are we representing our faith? How are we representing the Quran and the Prophet of Islam? In fact, today we need to be even more. Because Amir al-Mu'mineen would say, people are of two kinds. النَّاسُ صِنْفَانِ أَمَّا أَخُلْ لَكَ فِي الدِّينِ أَوْ نَظِيرٌ لَكَ فِي الْخَلْقِ Either your brother in faith or equal in humanity. And that has to be deeply embedded within our thinking, our process, our conduct, our children's education. We must not raise them to hate others just because they have a different religion or they disagree with us. We must not raise them to despise people. We must raise them with the language of Ali, the language of love, compassion, and mercy. We must raise them to understand their responsibility in society. We must raise them with the notion of kindness and generosity towards others, servitude towards others. Today, that is our mission as we follow in the footsteps of our Mawla, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And no doubt, his loss is not something that can be easily remedied or indeed discovered. His loss is something profound for people at that time and even today. But how do you measure a legacy of an individual? You measure them through what they left for mankind to benefit from. You look at, for example, Nahjul Balag. You look at these wonderful words, this constitution after the Quran for the well-being of human beings. A friend of mine who studied PhD doctorate in Cambridge University in the United Kingdom, he told me, he said, we have an engineering journal, which is several times a year, three, four publications a year. He says, the editor of this journal is non-Muslim. He says, I have noticed on a number of occasions on the editorial, he quotes from Nahjul Balag, the peak of eloquence. When people understand and discover the greatness, they can only admire how this man has brought about so much benefit to mankind. And our responsibility today is to speak to others about him too. Is to make people discover his greatness too. I need to be able to give people books about Amir al mumini I need to have websites and apps. I need to be able to be knowledgeable myself about the teachings, for example, that is found in Nahjul Balagha. I need to continue the legacy of my Imam in order to honor what he did and how he sacrificed everything so that the religion reaches me today so that the path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly highlighted. And that's why on a final night of his life, a few hours before he passed away, 
the narrations tell us it was the most difficult and painful hours for the Ahl al-Bayt. They wouldn't want to leave Imam alayhi salam. They realized it was time to bid farewell. Why? The doctor had come. He had analyzed Imam alayhi salam. And he had said that the poison had reached the brain. And he said to Amir al-Mu'mineen, there is no way to help. That's it. And Imam alayhi salam started to bid farewell to his family members. One after the other, he called Imam al-Hasan al-Mujtaba. He called Aba Abdullah al Hussein. He called his son Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya. He called his daughters. He called his wives. His advice to them, his words of encouragement to them, his telling them that they will encounter a lot of hardship, difficulties and punishment and challenges. People will punish them just because they are the Ahl al-Bayt, where they have not done anything wrong. They realized it was time to bid farewell, and that's why Amir al-Mu'mineen would prepare himself for this journey that he had set out from day one, Liqa'ullah, to meet Allah, where he would say, Ilahi, habbib ilayya liqa'at. Ya Allah, make this meeting something beloved to me. One of his daughters, Umm Kulthum, comes forward and said, Abata, man lana ba'dak? Who is going to look after us after you? Who is, looking to, who is going to protect us after you? Uh, one after the other, uh, they came and they bid their farewells. Uh, then Amir al Mu'mineen said to them, Hada Rasulullah, wa hada ammi Hamza, wa hada Ja'far al Tayyar. يقولون عجل قدومك إلينا فإنا إليك مشتاقون. This is my beloved brother Rasulullah. He says, come towards us. This is my uncle Hamza Jafar al Tayyar. They say we are in eager anticipation. We miss you, O Ali. Where are you? Then he says, وقال عليكم السلام لمثل هذا فليعمل الع. إن الله مع الذين اتقوا والذين هم محسنون. At that moment, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen realized these are the final moments that he will leave this world. He began with the dhikr of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. He began remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People around him realizing that the earth is going to be shattered without Ali ibn Abi Talib. وما زال يذكر الله ويشهد الشهاد. Allahu Akbar. Amir al Mu'mineen then faced towards the Qibla. His body was moved towards the Qibla. He said all this. ثم فاضت روحه الطاهرة أي رحم الله من نادى وعليا وإماما وسيدا ومظلوما when his soul left the body, his family all threw themselves on the body of their father, Amir al Mu'mineen. They were next to him when his body, when his soul left this world. They were crying, they were weeping. Allahu Akbar, Amir al Mu'mineen's body is washed, is shrouded, is buried by his sons and the closest of his companions. I say to him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, before you. You left this world, you had your family around you. Before you left this world, you could say goodbye to your loved ones. Your son Abba Abdullah on the plains of Karbala was alone. He had no one to bid farewell towards. He asked for water, no one would give him water. Oh Abba Abdullah, oh 
حسين يا غريب يا أمير المؤمنين when you left this world they washed your body they shrouded your body but what happens there was a burial for your body يا أمير المؤمنين but for your son Hussein there was no washing and no shrouding جاء الإمام زين العابدين إلى كربلاء he came to Karbala, Imam Zain al Abidin, to bury the body of his father, Aba Abdullah. He looked towards his father, Yabhathu Anha. He wanted to see where is my father, but he did not find difficulty in finding the body. It was bruised, it was battered, it was torn into pieces, it was covered with arrows, the head was separated from. From the body, he came. He sat next to the body. عليك من السلام أبا عبد الله. He then wanted to carry the body and bury it. Bani Asad came to him and said to him, يا ابن رسول الله, would you like any help? He said, إن معي من يعينني. No, don't worry. There are those with me that will help me. Yet he asked them for something. He said, if you can give me a piece of cloth. Oh, ابن رسول الله why do you want a piece of cloth حتى أجمع بها جسد أبي الحسين I want to gather the body parts of my father أبا عبد الله الله أكبر he couldn't pick up the body every time he did one part of it would fall off he gathered the body parts in a sheet he placed the sheet inside the قبر inside the grave بني أسد said but we saw him leave without sealing the grave. We wondered where he went. And then he came back. He was carrying something in his hands. And he was carrying the fingers of Abu Abdullah that was severed he placed them on his body but he wasn't finished جعل يبحث مرة أخرى في ميدان كربلاء وإذا به يحمل شيئا تحت عبائه he was carrying something under his cloak his عباءه he entered the grave he placed what he was carrying on the chest of his father they asked him يا ابن رسول الله what are you doing? What is that on the chest? This is my brother Abdullah Ali and Al Azgar. My father said, My father said, Waladi Ali, Ejal Ebni Allah Sadri.